Welcome, everyone. Uh, we, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the uh, director of the Skyscraper Museum, and I'm sitting here in our gallery in front of one of the uh, displays on the cases. You see the, um, the 19... 90s version of the South Sea Seaport Pier 17 behind me and part of our exhibition uh, that looks at Lower Manhattan in the um, since 9/11. But that's not why we're here tonight. We are here to uh, be regaled with stories of the uh, original Fulton Fish Market by Jonathan Reese. Uh, Jonathan is a professor at the University of Colorado, um, the Pueblo campus, uh, where he teaches in the Department of History. He is um, a historian who works on um, all aspects of labor history, uh, history of technology, social, political history. And the Fulton Fish Market brings together a lot of those perspectives, um, also the history of food. And um, Jonathan is going to give us a, a, an overview tonight um, of his book uh, and also of um, some of the, the, the different um, sources and resources um, through which as someone in Colorado and someone during COVID, as he will um, describe, he came to the to the, the fish market um, in uh, mostly through text and historical sources. Um, he's not a New Yorker, but he'd spent time here walking the streets uh, of South Street Seaport. Um, and I want to share with you a few of the slides and a few of our resources on the to situate you in the neighborhoods of. Um, of Fulton Street and uh, the South Street Seaport Museum, which is really the way that I think about the, the um, history of the, the seaport now, having, um, going forward there, um, having worked on the waterfronts for an exhibition the museum did about um, five years ago called Millennium Lower, um, Lower Manhattan in the 1990s, who looked, when, when we looked at the strained fortunes um, of downtown and the transformation into uh, a, a neighborhood that was more mixed use, but with, um, with real estate interests that were changing uh, the, the, um, the, um, the, the riverfronts and the waterfronts dramatically, just as technology had, had been changing them irrevocably. Irrevocably, uh, and you'll see in the exhibition installation shots um, some of the great photographs that I'm going to show you now by the um, local photographer Barbara Mensch, uh, and you see um, I'm afraid a cutoff version of her book, square formatted book, South Street, uh, and also uh, in the shadow of genius, a, a book that she did of her photographs and some researches on the Brooklyn Bridge uh, and the, the Roeblings. Uh, and Barbara has two videos on our website that I invite you to watch where you can see her photographs in much um, closer detail and hear her recount her last um, three or four decades of experience of living in the South Street Seaport neighborhood and especially photographing South Street um, denizens, um, like I will show you in just a moment in her photographs. The overview of the physical space um, that Jonathan is, is going to take us into and onto the streets and back into the history, you can see here in an overview, and you can see how relatively small it is on the East River waterfront, how the historic buildings here at the center constitute really only um, a, a, a couple of square blocks or even less of the um, original late 19th and then uh, late 18th and then um, 19th century warehouses and counting houses that populated um, the, 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 the maritime waterfront um, and served Wall Street as well. Um, but you can see how the skyscrapers um, have begun to uh, march along Water Street um, and to overcome like giant, um, like giants or elephants, mammoths, um, uh, pressing down on the sh the short um, historic buildings of the seaport. Uh, you see uh, in their pre-renovated state, Skirmahorn Row, um, that now houses both shops and the South Street Seaport Museum, one of the venues. You see in Barbara Minch's photographs uh, some of the working. Uh, 
restaurants and and um, the the various um, you know fish market functions uh, as you see there, as well as the fishermen themselves, because this is a wonderful photograph that Barbara took, which um, is titled "The Last Fishing Boat" and was indeed the crew that she managed to uh, uh, cajole into posing for her of the very last time that a fishing boat came to dock at the seaport to um, offload its wares um, in, into the market, um, something that uh, transportation technology changed when, when trucks began to bring um, the fish uh, and from, um, from all parts um, of um, uh, America. And um, the tin building, uh, as it's cleaned up um, after uh, an early, it's early morning hours, and there, if you want to go to Barbara's website, you can take down that link. Um, the tin building, which uh, Jonathan will show us, um, and the, uh, replaced by the Pier 17, now replaced by um, yet another venture uh, in the urban festival market and commercial um, and touristic and cultural center that is um, today's South Street Seaport. Uh, and well, that didn't happen, um, the Frank Gehry um, downtown Wall Street um, example. So actually going forward um, and inviting Jonathan to come onto the screen now, um, and, and then he will be screen sharing his own presentation. Um, as I said, Jonathan Reese um, is a professor at the University of Colorado in the, the Pueblo campus. Uh, his books beside the um, Fulton Fish Market here include um, Refrigeration Nation, A History of Ice, Appliances, and Enterprise in America uh, um, from 2013, and Before Refrigeration, How We Used to Get Ice uh, in uh, 2018. So part of the history of technology as well as the history of food are some of the things that Jonathan is going to um, delight us with tonight. So Jonathan, will you please take over? I'll go away. Um, before I do, let me remember to tell you that if you have questions, please enter them in the chat function um, addressed to the Skyscraper Museum, and I will get those. Don't address them to me or to anyone or, or to Jonathan. The ones that we'll read and then translate onto the screen right. um, in questions for Jonathan will come through the Skyscraper Museum chat. Okay, Jonathan, thank you. Take over. All right. That took me a little bit, but do you see the book slide right now? Yes. Okay, so we're good. Fantastic. Okay, um, let's talk about the Fulton Fish Market. Um, before I even get into this, I um, should talk just a little bit about why some guy from Colorado is writing about Lower Manhattan. Um, I'm from New Jersey, if that helps originally, but again, I've never lived in New York. I never saw the original Fulton Fish Market. I come into the subject with a certain amount of humility. I don't want to tell you how how you should experience the history of New York or tell you that things that you saw were wrong or anything like that. As to the question, why are you interested in the Fulton Fish Market? Um, the answer is this guy. Um, Joseph Mitchell uh, was the city reporter for the New Yorker magazine for many, many years um, from you know, really the late 1930s, if I remember right, until his death. Uh, if you haven't read the book on the right up in the old hotel, um, and you are a New Yorker, um, I mean, I'm tempted to say shame on you, but honestly, you're in for a special treat. Um, my editor would kill me for saying this, but you should probably read it before you get to mine, because um, it's just a wonderful book. Um, brief bit of literary criticism, I, I practically read for a living um, history, all sorts of other things, and I just think this is pretty close to the best book I've ever read in my entire life. I mean, it's not perfect, maybe... 80% of it, though, is, is just the most incredible nonfiction you'd ever read. Mitchell is so good about two things. Uh, one is he gets a feeling like you're there. It's like time travel. Lots of thick description, lots of good environment, uh, environmental settings. And he goes to places in New York like dime museums and banquets uh, where nobody else is going. So it's just a, it's a remarkable picture of things. The other thing which I think is, to me, ties in very well with the Skyscraper Museum's mission, is Mitchell gives me the impression, or he gave me the impression, 
um, that literally every block in New York is historically significant, and not just Manhattan, all, all the five boroughs. He can tell you the value and the significance of anything he happened to visit during his long career. And, and that is what got me interested in New York history, just reading Mitchell starting in the early 90s. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, 20 years later, I decided maybe I actually might be able to contribute to it. Um, so even before COVID, um, I went to New York, I went to the New York Public Library, I started reading the Mitchell papers, uh, and I learned pretty quickly that towards the end of his life, um, which is sort of famously unproductive, but that's a whole other subject, where he wasn't getting much done, one of the things that he wanted to get done uh, was a history of the Fulton Fish Market. And the Fulton Fish Market sort of comes up as a side subject and up in the old hotel. He's a big fan of it. There are a few things like the old Mr. Flood stories that are very closely related to the market, um, but it's not the center of his thing. It's not the center of his work, uh, but he wanted to write a history of the market. And I realized that, that this was something that still needed to be done since it was such an important place. Um, so I did. Um, I had two advantages over Mitchell, though. Um, the first uh, is online newspaper archives. Um, I don't know if you've done historical research, if you've done genealogy or something, and been interested in newspaper archives. Um, but really, in the last 15 years or so, I won't say every, but just an unbelievable number of major American newspapers are now available online, and they're searchable by the word. So you can type in Fulton Fish Market and something like Chronicling America, which is available for free uh, through the Library of Congress, and you will get hundreds and hundreds of stories. Actually, a lot of them are listed as just Fulton Market, which is another subject I'll get to eventually, but Fulton Market or Fulton Fish Market, and you can see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories about the market. And what happened, like I told the guys from CBS that they're following a long tradition, is that reporters of all kinds would go down to Fulton Fish Market or go out to the Bronx to see the new Fulton Fish Market and tell people where their fish came from. And this story got done over and over and over again. Um, during COVID, I joked to myself, because I was the only one listening, that you could write a pretty good history of the Fulton Fish Market just by typing Fulton Market into the New York Times archives. But of course, New York has, you know, famously has dozens of papers at, at its height. Uh, and there are people from all over the country who come to New York just to visit that market. So while everyone's in lockdown and I'm on sabbatical, what I was able to do is actually do pretty close to primary source research, reading story after story about the Fulton Fish Market just on my computer screen in the room where I am now. And they look very much the same, but if you read enough of them and you sort of put them in chronological order, you can begin to tell the story about change over time. Uh, Iceberg Tommy, by the way, is one of my favorites. He's one of the colorful characters who gets you know, sort of featured in a lot of these stories. Uh, crazy people work there. It was another reason that people wanted to find out what was going on. Iceberg Tommy used to dip in the river um, when it was really cold. Um, the other thing I had is a framework. Um, Mitchell, honestly, uh, is enough of a framework to, to write this history. Um, Mitchell was interested, if you know his work, he was interested in restaurants like Sloppy Louis. Uh, he was interested in the fish market itself. You could see that in the old Mr. Flood stories. He also did a lot of stories about fishermen. So you can begin to see uh, a food chain, a provisioning chain. Um, this is something that's sort of influential to me going back to graduate school. Um, Nature's Metropolis uh, is a very famous book among historians about Chicago, actually, but probably its most important chapter talks about um, the chain for provisioning meat, where cattle are uh, fattened up in Texas, they're driven north to the cow towns, put on the railroads, slaughtered on the south side of Chicago and brought to places like New York City on the railroad. Um, in order to make uh, beef more affordable to people. Um, that's an important chain. And we food historians spend a lot of, pay a lot of attention to that because it's sort of argued to be the first big complete food chain that all the other ones are based on. Um, I did some work on this in Refrigeration Nation, which is my general history of the American refrigeration industry. Um, 
and, and that makes all sorts of perishable food possible. But when I started looking at the um, Fulton Fish Market, I realized there's a fish provisioning chain. And that fish provisioning chain is centered in New York at the Fulton Fish Market. And it's at least three decades uh, older than the meat provisioning chain that's centered in Chicago. Um, so my history of the Fulton Fish Market is sort of organized around that. Um, but the problem with organizing it around that um, is I don't quite spend all my time in the Fulton Fish Market. I spend some time uh, out on the fishing boats. I spend some time in restaurants. I spend some time talking about you know retail fish stores in the city. Um, and I, you know I promised my uh, publisher that I would do this in about a hundred thousand words. So my I, just worth noting that my history of the Fulton Fish Market has a lot more than just the Fulton Fish Market in it. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. Um, but since this really is the first book length treatment of the Fulton Fish Market, um, I, I'm hoping that other people will come after me. Here's my uh, very, very rudimentary um, you know, Microsoft Word version of the Fulton Fish Market provisioning chain. Uh, point of capture is on the right. I mean, imagine this like a map of the United States, right? That's out in the ocean. The Fulton Fish Market at the lower in Manhattan. Um, is the middle, uh, sort of the, the 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 spokes of this thing, and then the point of consumption uh, what might be a restaurant, it might be a retail fish store, um, it might be your table. Um, what's interesting about this, and if I were better at graphics, I would have done something with this, but you'll have to just imagine this, is that as the Fulton Fish Market gets older. Um, the spread of the arrows in all of these fish provisioning cha chains changes. So the point of consumption on the left in its early history is all over the country. Like the guy from CBS said, uh, two thirds at its height, two thirds of the fish sold in America goes through Fulton Fish Market. So it's being sent to Chicago. I've seen it, I've seen oysters from the Fulton Fish Market go as far west as Denver. So imagine New York being the center of this hub, much the way Chicago was for beef a few decades earlier. As time passes, um, that point of consumption is going to get closer and closer to New York. By the 1920s, the fish isn't going more than 100 miles from the city. But New, York, New Yorkers had a lot of fish, so you could still make a lot of money selling specialty fish to New Yorkers and the Fulton Fish Market still is still important and still a profitable place. At the same time, moving to the right, uh, further up the chain, the point of capture is going to move further and further away for a lot of these fish. So in the early 19th century, 40 miles offshore is a long way for uh, a fish to come uh, to the Fulton Fish Market when the boats are small and the preservation methods are pretty bad. Um, that obviously changes. Probably the key point of that is when they figured out how to preserve fish on an airplane in the early 1970s. Um, so by the end of the original Fulton Fish Market, and certainly still true today, you can fly in fish from anywhere on the planet, um, and it can still be quite fresh uh, when it hits the point of consumption. So one of those, that spread of arrows is 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 getting smaller over time and the other one's growing and i thought that was pretty interesting so what do i talk about in the book what am i going to talk about tonight um i'm going to talk about that chain um but as i was just saying before all this started i try to take that chain in a, a lot of different ways um i'm sort of a business business historian i am interested in the history of technology much of that has to do with the preservation of fish I uh, became interested in the fish themselves. So both in the book and here, I'm gonna talk about some of the more popular fish at the market. Um, and this is the first bit of urban history I've ever done. I know it's important um, to a museum located in lower Manhattan, try to say a few words about the, the changes in that neighborhood uh, over time. And, and a little bit towards the end about the people who work there and the people who are involved in that whole chain. Uh, let's do the, the basics right now. Um, if you grew up with the Fulton Fish Market, if you read anything about it in all those newspaper stories, if they showed up on your breakfast table uh, because you grew up anywhere around New York, you know that the Fulton Fish Market, or if you, know, if you read Mitchell in the New Yorker, 
Um, the fold and fish market, you know, as early as the middle of the 20th century, had a rep reputation for being in eternal decline. It was a place that never changed. Uh, and because it was a place that never changed, it was eventually going to go extinct, um, which finally happened in 2005 when they moved it to the Bronx. Um, that reputation is sort of the thing that I'm arguing against throughout the entire book. There are lots of changes in the Fulton Fish Market. You just have to be able to look for them at different ends of the provisioning chain. And probably the most important part of that change, the most important change, is, is in the way the market did business. It starts as one of, oh, I forget the exact number, 20 or 30 retail markets in Manhattan. I mean, it depends on the year what that number is, where anybody who lived there had to go in order to get their food. And you could buy anything there. Around 18, uh, there is fish available there, but it wasn't the only place in New York you could go to get fish. Around 1850, um, the wholesale, the fish business begins to concentrate there and wholesalers begin to take over the operation. Um, it, it became sort of uh, convenient and efficient for all the fish in Manhattan to be sold at Fulton Fish Market because it was so close to the water. And over the next 70 years, the wholesale fish market basically became the entire operation of what's going on there. Um, the retail market gradually fades away and all you get is a fish market. From 1920 until the time it moves, it's just a wholesale fish market. And that's the thing that most people remember. Um, which companies operated there? That's a really hard question. Um, I'm not going to read that little quote from an article, but it gives you an idea of why that's such a hard question. There are maybe, uh, depending on the year, about 90, 100, 120 different stalls at the Fulton Fish Market. Uh, some of them are run by the same company, but that's at least 40, 50, 60 different companies. Those companies keep changing their names as people die or as they merge or then the sun takes over. And it simply becomes really complicated to figure out the businesses. Most of them are relatively small, um, but you know it's a it's a good way to make a living. One exception to that rule um, is Eugene G. Blackford, um, who I highlight, I think, because of his role in the history of the overall market. Uh, Blackford was an important guy. Um, his company. Um, runs the Fulton Fish Market Museum, which is at the top of one of those buildings pictured over there on the left. Um, he also had a trout show going for about 25 years. When trout season came, uh, he would open up the show and then suddenly sport fishermen would come to see uh, you know, uh, both gear and fish and maybe visit the Fulton Fish Market Museum. And this is the late 19th century, and people would go there for the spectacle, and that helps explain why all the reporters are there. And I think that's part of the reason that the Fulton Fish Market is sort of in the memory of the city, uh, even if you know you had to get up in the middle of the night in the, in the 1970s if you wanted to see it. It was a sight. It was a spectacle. People kept telling that story. Uh, and in the late 19th century, there was lots of stories to tell because of people like Blackford. Um, what else? Uh, technology. Um, let's concentrate on this for just a second. I did not realize this until I started looking at fish. How do you how do you transport a fish uh, and have it uh, be fresh? How do you move it over space over time uh, if you don't have ice and you don't have refrigeration? You keep it alive. Um, so the first important fish technology is the fish well in a fishing boat. Here it's at the front of the boat. And what you would do is you would just have a tank full of uh, a tank full of seawater in your hull, and you would catch the fish, and you would drop the live fish in the well, and the fish wouldn't start rotting until um, you know until it died. And so you would bring the fish, you would uh, put it up to the pier next to the Fulton Fish Market. Uh, the guys who worked there would get a big net. They would take the fish out of the fish well, drop them in something called a fish car. Uh, which is nothing but a cage for fish uh, in the East River itself hanging off the pier. And as there's demand for each individual fish, they'd be taken out um, uh, and sold to the people who cared about it, the people who were buying it. Uh, and that's how you can have a fishing provisioning chain as complicated as the one later done for meat, even in the early, um, even in the early 19th century. 
But it's around 1850 where ice becomes really popular. Um, I had a request to do a little bit on the New York ice industry, which I actually did in my previous book on refrigeration. I'll try to say a little bit more about this than I would otherwise. Um, ice is really important in the fish market. Um, ice is used to display, as you can see it on the left. Um, that's because it keeps the fish's skin and eyes moist. Uh, even before it spoils, you don't want um, the skin to dry up because people won't, won't want to buy it. It won't look good. Um, it's also used on the right. Uh, that is an ice crusher. So you would crush it uh, and then pack it on your boat because as time goes on, fish wells go from being a place for water for being a place to for ice. Once ice becomes readily accessible, then you put the ice in your fish well, you take the fish, you kill it right there out in the sea, and then you pack it in the ice and it will still be preserved relatively well as long as you don't go too far away. Um, that drawing on the right is of the, the Fulton Fish Market Ice Crusher. You can actually see that uh, right behind the, um, of, uh, the South Street Seaport Museum. It still exists. Uh, it was cool. Uh, I enjoyed seeing that. They showed me that. Um, the, the ice industry in New York, this is my little extra bit, is probably the, in fact, I know it's the biggest uh, market for ice in the country. Most of it is cut in the Hudson uh, and the tributaries to the Hudson further upstate. Uh, what you would do is it's it's sort of like a agricultural process. You would have uh, horses who are on the ice. You would hook something that looks like uh, uh, looks like a plow up behind it. You would cut the blocks out. You would put those blocks in ice houses built along the banks of the river or the lake where you're cutting the ice from. Uh, that would sit until summer. Then you would pack it onto barges, take it down the Hudson, and literally drop it off in lower Manhattan. Some of it's going to go to drivers uh, who are running their um, carts or trucks all over the city, uh, giving ice to individual, uh, you know, as far as, as individual apartment buildings or businesses that depended on ice. Uh, but a lot of it went to the Fulton Fish Market as well because it was a very ice intensive place. All right, so another change that happens that affects the course of the market is the change in fishing technology. Um, this is something of a simplification, but in the 1850s, you get the first trawling. Uh, which is like really long lines, hundreds of feet with hundreds of hooks on them. Uh, and uh, the fishing boat would go out in the ocean. Uh, then uh, smaller boats would go out from the fishing boats and would trawl for individual fish a um, hundred at a time, uh, sometimes more. Uh, and that turns out to be a very efficient way to catch fish. And then the Fulton fish market has to adapt to that increased volume. Um, starting in the 1880s, but really true around World War I, you get the first trawlers uh, as opposed to trawling. Same word, slightly different process though. Um, these are the first boats that are going to run huge nets along the bottom of the ocean and just simply take up everything. Um, that, of course, has become something of a, an, I was going to say an art, but really, I mean the opposite of an art. People have just had gigantic nets, and this is part of the reason so many fish are in danger, uh, because it's just such an efficient way of fishing. Um, but you get an earlier version of that early in the 20th century, um, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the, businesses that are uh, selling fish at the market invest in these boats, and then they have to find a way to sell them. So the volume is increasing. Um, the volume is increasing and the fish market uh, adapts in order to handle that, in part by you know, producing more ice. Um, let's talk about some of the fish. Um, it's very hard to pick out which fish to talk about because, you know, there are lots of fish that are being sold there at any given time. I think I ended up picking which fish to talk about based on which showed up most in the newspaper articles. A uh, codfish is really the 19th century fish. Um, you know, if you say I would like some fish and it's 1875, you're probably going to get cod. I think it's worth noting that most of those cod are caught off New England, which gives you an idea of the orientation of the arrows in that um, terrible graphic I showed you earlier. Uh, 19th century, it's mostly north. Um, a lot of it actually doesn't even get landed in New York. Um, there is an early train running from uh, Gloucester and Boston to New York every single night um, so that the cod that is caught off Boston 
um, could, can be sold at the Fulton Fish Market the next day. Uh, Manhattan is another important fish, but you have never eaten it. Uh, it is a small, oily, bony fish um, uh, that is important because lots of other bigger fish eat Manhattan. Uh, they travel in schools, uh, and it is done uh, sometimes for industrial oil. Um, but in terms of my book, it's most important as a, as a bait. When I talked about those trawling hooks with hundreds of hooks, most of them will have a single Manhattan on the end. Lots of different names for that. Um, don't even get me started. Moss bunker, um, it's all the same fish. Um, I think I have all the synonyms in the book, but I just went with Manhattan. Um, very important. Oh, and it's it's a model. The, the first steam trawlers um, are put out to uh, get schools of Manhattan. And then people realized that you could catch other fish that way. So it's a model for the, the depletion of other species as well. Um, shad is a favorite of mine. Um, I think it's because when the first shad of the season came in, uh, there was a little parade through the Fulton Fish Market where everybody marched and brought it to the first, uh, the, the, the wholesaler who had commissioned it. Um, but it's also a, a pretty interesting fish. Uh, it is one of those fish that start in the ocean, but travel up river to, uh, to spawn. And um, uh, shad uh, at the Hudson River were supposed to be the best shad possible. Uh, the thing is, it's a very popular fish, so it is rapidly depleted. And when a fish is rapidly depleted, the tactic of the wholesalers is simply to buy their fish from further away. As preservation, preser as preservation techniques get better. It becomes possible to get your fish from further away. And although I didn't do it, it's at least theoretically possible to sort of count count rivers going down south. Uh, so by the time the, you know, the, by the 1950s all around, you'll get rivers in Georgia and Florida supplying New York with shad. A uh, bony fish, um, supposedly very tasty. It got, fil got filleted at the fillet houses near the Fulton Fish Market. Um, but my understanding is that you cannot have Hudson River shot anymore uh, because of the pollution. Um, but of course, the water's getting better. Maybe that will change before too long. Oh, um, shad fishing. Um, this is also another interesting thing about it. It's not a fishing boat sort of thing. Basically, the shad fishermen set their nets um, on the river during shad season. And I always wondered how you could navigate the Hudson. Uh, when there are all these shad fishing nets, uh, you know, sort of marked by poles uh, throughout the river. And finally, when I saw the painting on the right, I realized what was going on, which is that all the shad fishermen are just over there on the edges. Uh, and that was enough to get uh, a lot of shad. Uh, oysters, um, unlike a lot of other fish, oysters have been done. Uh, there are good books on New York and its cultural importance uh, for oysters. Um, I think what I contribute to the oyster discussion um, is, is, is sort of the long 200 year history of oysters in New York. Uh, they're quite famous in the 19th century as being uh, the food of everybody, working people and rich people alike. Um, in the 19th century, the Fulton Fish Market, the retail place, uh, was supposed to be the best place to eat oysters in the entire city. So you would go not because you wanted to buy your own oysters and cook them at home, you would go because the oyster stands there um, and like Dorland's, the oyster restaurant, um, uh, were just apparently really great places. Um, the oyster wholesalers were actually on the other side of Manhattan um, near Washington Market, another great extinct New York market. Um, starting around the 20th century, um, New York oysters have to be imported because of the pollution. Uh, and as the old wholesalers go out of business, the people with connections throughout the country, the fish wholesalers, begin to take over the um, wholesale oyster business. Some of that business is conducted on barges, uh, as you can see on the right, like the George M. Still Company, where you can walk up and get your oysters, or um, uh, or uh, you know you would bring a, a cart or a truck and and take them out to your oyster restaurant. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting is, of course, um, I had heard of the Oyster Bar at Grand Central for a really long time, and I sort of connected that with New York being an oyster city, 
But by the time that restaurant uh, came along, let alone when it became famous, New York became dependent on non-New York oysters. Uh, you know, places all up and down the East Coast or Canada is where you get the best oysters from these days. Well, actually, I think Long Island is making a comeback. Um, but compared to the 19th century, where you can get oysters out of New York Harbor, even Long Island is still a pretty long way away. It was really, there's a, about a chapter and a half on oysters in the book. It was something I really felt compelled to write about. Um, let's talk about the neighborhood. Uh, as the market changes, some of that is because the neighborhood around it changes and the neighborhood around it changes and sometimes because the market changes. Um, that is a map of the neighborhood from 1926. It is the basis of the map at the front of my book. Um, and, you know, it's not accurate really for much of the time except for 1926, but it's sort of like in the middle of the history of the market, which is why I used it. The use of the blocks changes, the size of the streets changes, the purposes of the buildings changes. Um, but that's just a, a sort of, it was a good place for me to talk about um, to talk about, you know, physically where all these spaces are. One of the really confusing things I had to figure out is when somebody says, I'm going to go visit the Fulton Fish Market, I had to figure out where they're going. Um, in this 26 map, the two things highlighted in yellow, Fulton Fish Market, are sort of the two buildings that were operational for most of the 20th century. Um, the retail building is across South Street from the one on the left, but I didn't use it in my map. But it's really important to note here is that the fish market is the whole neighborhood. Well, you know, you think about you know the, the fish market being down to one building, the tin building, but in fact, the fish market was everywhere. Um, it's about a six block radius. Uh, and there are people who have stalls in the retail buildings. There are people who did business all over. Um, there's even uh, a freshwater fish market. Um, uh, which is over by Peck Slip. And so it's just, it's not like you think of a market, you think of one building and you go to the market. But it's just important to know for the history of the market that the history of the market is the whole neighborhood. Of course, it's called the South Street Seaport because this is the place in the early 19th century was sort of the main entry point into New York. Um, but you know, before it was the South Street Seaport, it is the place where the Fulton Fish Market was. And it is, it is a district, not just a couple of structures. And I can't emphasize that enough. The other thing I think it's worth emphasizing is that the business itself isn't really taking place indoors for the most part. A lot of the business, uh, certainly in its last years, uh, uh, as Barbara mentions, is well documented. It's just taking place out in the streets. Um, and this is one of the reasons that there was a lot of pressure to change that, because most people don't want to think that their fish are sitting out exposed to the elements uh, for hours on end. Um, uh, so it, even in the neighborhood itself, if you have a, a, a company that has its own building, um, you didn't have to go into the building. They did the, their business out in the streets there as well. Um, so that's important to note. Um, personally, um, I, I feel like this should be better documented. Like there should be a plaque, you know, with one of Barbara's pictures in front of the tin building and say, you know, it's not inside where the business took place. It's this whole neighborhood and, and that should be noted and, and preserved and better documented. Um, we talked a little bit already about development in the seaport. Um, you can see uh, sort of in the center background here, uh, the two uh, main fish market buildings. Uh, the one on the left, uh, which just left this world, I think a year or two ago, uh, was known as the New Market Building from 1939. Uh, the Tin Building, uh, which has been moved and redeveloped and preserved is the one on the right. Um, the retail building from the 19th century, um, you know, actually disappeared around 1950. Uh, which is a shame because that was apparently a, a really spectacular place. If you go there, it's the one that has sort of brass, brass. The the space itself is has brass plaques of the same fish going all the way around it. That's the space. Um, but it was, I think, the most important part of uh, you know the most important retail market of 19th century New York. Um, what happens is in the 1960s, uh, a series of people, including the folks uh, who uh, are behind the South Street Seaport Museum, 
I'm sort of made uh, an arrangement uh, with a lot of interests came to a truce uh, where they decided that they would let some of the seaport district go in exchange for preserving other parts of it. And sort of, you know, the general history of development in New York, it you know, starts at the tip of Man lower tip of Manhattan, goes all the way up north and out to the boroughs uh, around the, uh, you know, the turn of the 20th century. But this little part of Manhattan, in part because of the Fulton Fish Market, gets bypassed. And the reason it gets bypassed is because there's, you know, an active industrial business going on, you know, well after most industrial businesses leave Manhattan. Um, and, you know, by the time uh, the 60s roll around, the real estate prices are already good enough that people want to try, you know, putting in offices and putting in um, apartment buildings and having people actually live there. But if there is a giant rolling fish market that's going around, you know, most days of the week in the middle of the night, that's going to make it a much less appealing place to live. Uh, if there is a giant rolling fish market and you can smell fish, uh, you know, even after that fish market is gone all over your neighborhood, that is going to make it a much less appealing place to live. So there is tremendous pressure for the fish market to move um, as early as the 60s, and it only grows over time until Rudy Giuliani um, uh, makes it something of a crusade in the early 1990s. Uh, for me, there are many reasons you can cite uh, poor refrigeration, um, the, the role of the mob in the, the market itself. Uh, but for me, it's it's that kind of pressure that's, that is the prime explanation for why that fish market finally moves in 2005. Honestly, I think it's a miracle it didn't leave 30 years earlier um, uh, because the pressure was was that tough that early. Um, lastly, it's worth noting that the fish market itself is a community, um, and the people there have their own stories to tell, and those stories um, are documented um, to really nowhere. I was going to say, and it is true that, that, and I say this in the book, that Joseph Mitchell was a people person, and he was interested in people. But if you do know Mitchell, you know, even the people in the fish market he does talk to are not even the people who work there. You know, he does a very famous profile of Sloppy Louie, of Sloppy Louis. He talks to fishermen who sell at the market, but he doesn't talk to the people who work there. Even old Mr. Flood, with three stories that are technically set at the market, old Mr. Flood is like Mitchell, uh, a fan of the market. He's not a person who works there. It is a very difficult place. Uh, to get people to to talk about what their experiences are. Um, and I think I originally planned to at least try to go up to the Bronx and see if I can get some of the stories that I could use in the last chapters of my book. But then COVID hit, um, and it was hard enough just to get to New York, let alone to meet brand new people when I was there. So again, I think it's worth noting that the people of the fish market have their own stories, and the stories are are are, are worth preserving and and it's not that I wouldn't like to put them in this book, um, but they're not the sort of thing that's already that's shown up in the written record. And a lot of those stories that I used because I was so newspaper centric and a lot of what people know about the market who never went there is, of course, about the mafia. Um, this is a quote I used in the book found in the New York Daily News that I think sort of epitomizes what I imagine most of the people who worked at the market thought about all this attention to the mobsters uh, who had some influence there. It's like, they all think I'm a gangster. Um, I am, I'm comfortable, I, actually, I made that distinction. Actually, since you showed the CBS story, it's pretty funny. I talked to those guys, I was actually filmed in Denver. They were doing another story. I drove up to talk to them. And I talked to them about the market for about half an hour, and it turns out, and I didn't realize this until I listened to that story again here tonight, that the only stuff they used for me was the stuff about the mafia. And the mafia was the last thing in the world I wanted to talk about. Um, I, mean, I knew it's an inevitable question, um, but it was the very last part of the book I wrote about because it's the thing that I have by far the least interest in. Um, because the mafia sort of sucks all the attention out of the room, and it really shouldn't. 
Um, certainly they play a role in development and I think probably the eventual moving of the market, but that's not the real story. And I think one of the, hopefully the good things that comes out of this book that covers the whole history is people will realize it's an important place, irrespective of the attention that the mafia brings. So I would like to end these sorts of talks just noting for New Yorkers that I hope um, that if you're interested in the subject, um, you will help us collect ephemera, you'll collect the stories of the people who work there. And, and I think that there are remaining buildings there that deserve to be saved because of their role in the market. Um, the South Street Seaport Museum is the best collection of, of Fulton Fish Market stuff in New York, but even that's relatively limited. Um, so I am now friends with all of those folks. Um, they are expanding um, their displays and working on more Fulton Fish Market stuff. And my hope is that we can get more of that out so that it's better remembered um, in lower Manhattan as an important part of New York history. That's it for me. That That's my contacts, if anyone wants to talk. Thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, and uh, let me just mention again that if anyone wants to ask questions, pose them in the chat to the Skyscraper Museum, and then I will communicate those those questions um, to uh, to Jonathan. And, and I know this. I know this technically ends at seven, but I I got time. I can stick around. Some of you, it's probably dinner time, <laughs> but. Um... I will I will stick around until the questions are done. Okay, well, we have ten minutes, maybe fifteen minutes, and in, um, in in order to talk a little bit further, um, so let me begin by um, asking this kind of urban change question. Uh, for those who joined the uh, the webinar, the the program a, a little bit later, we began before six o'clock with uh, about a seven minute video by the CBS um, morning, Saturday morning news program uh, that uh, you can, if you'd like to see it, if you missed it uh, for this program, you can go to YouTube and, and find it there, which uh, celebrated or commemorated the 200th anniversary of, uh, of the founding of the Fulton Fish Market, no longer uh, in South Street Seaport, but now up in the Bronx since 2005. Um, and in those images and with the interviews uh, of, the, of some of the fishmongers today, we see a kind of industrialized environment um, and clean, efficient, uh, a place that works uh, in not in the kind of density of the urban context of a place uh, like the original East River um, uh, location of, of the market, and especially the wharves where the, uh, the the fish would be offloaded, as as you showed us. So, can you talk a little bit how um, uh, trucks and shipping? changed and taking this very interesting idea that you presented in your in your graphic at the beginning about how the distribution changed where first it was wide and then it got more local how did trucks figure in that and indeed what's the difference between um a market where where fish have to be um put into some sort of what canning or what well, you know how did we get the fish to Denver the oysters uh to Denver that sounds more like a factory than it does like a market so can you distinguish that because the modern fish market looks more a little bit more like a factory I can um let, let's 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 do the Let's do what's the right side of my graphic first, then I'll do the left side of the graphic. So I'll start at the beginning of the chain and go through the market itself and then do the left part. Um, the reason the market is where it is is because of all those early markets, Fulton Fish Market, that location had the best access to water. And so the idea is, you know, in the year 1820s is that the, the boat will pull up right next to the place where it's sold and the fish is going to travel absolutely the shortest distance so that you can get it freshest when you're in the city. Um, that changes when the volume changes. Um, when railroads, for instance, come in, the, the, loaded, the closest railroad hub is in the Bronx. So what happens is if you've got that that night train from Boston with all that fish coming in, 
it's brought into a station in the Bronx. It's packed on a barge, but then it goes right down the east, the East River, and it's it's loaded off. Um, trucks are more efficient for that once they become very popular, really in the 1920s. And that becomes one of the pressures to um, move the market because it is not the greatest place to drive a truck, particularly before the, the creation of the FDR drive. And that's part of the reason uh, nobody wants to live there because you have all these trucks and the exhaust and the noise in the middle of the night. Um, but you know they 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 found a way. You know anywhere as far away as Philadelphia, people will come to the Fulton Fish Market because sort of historically that's where you're going to find the best fish. But over time, as the technology gets better, uh, people, including New York restaurateurs who care about these sorts of things, begin to get better options. Um, there are uh, as the technology improves, you can. Um, you know, I'm just thinking about dry ice, for instance. You can have sort of a point to point situation where you can bypass the Fulton Fish Market entirely. So by the very end of the of its time, the Fulton Fish Market is specializing primarily in specialty expensive fish because it's just such a pain in the butt in order to get anything through there, to get anything from there. So the market, the market has to change as the technology changes. How do you get oysters to Denver? Um, ice. It's all ice. Um, and ice is in many ways still the most important uh, refrigeration tool for fish of all kinds. Um, you can, I mean, you can use lots of different ways. I mean, the, the market in the Bronx is at a particular temperature, but because of the conditions of the skin and the eyes, um, you got to have ice involved or otherwise it's just not going to look palatable. And so ice, but I, ice, ice works in the 1890s. It works in the 1990s. Um, we have a question from Owen Goodfriend, an urban historian. Um, so let me pose this or read it to you um, because it, it relates a little to what we were saying. Can you say something about the geographic breadth of the fisheries whose produce flow, pro, flowed through Fulton um, at its height. You mentioned New England, but um, he's heard that Canadian maritime fish oh. went through New York, um, even if it, was, if it was to be sold in Toronto. Yeah, um, that's true too. Uh, it is such a focal point um, that you get north into Canada. Um, Blackford, the guy I was talking about, actually had his own salmon fishery in Canada. He was the first person to vertically integrate in that way. And of course, um, forgive me if I can't remember all the fish. You know, I, I, I could when I was writing it because I kind of notes. But there are plenty of, of fish from as far south as uh, Florida uh, that are brought in. Um, North Carolina is big in the late 19th century. Florida, turn of the 20th century, that are brought in the same way. Um, so it, it is it is. And of course, now it's by airplane. You could get it you know, anything in New York from everywhere. Um, but even when you're still dependent on boats one way or the other, it was is the whole eastern seaboard. So we're back to a, a national market. It, um, if it began more nationally, well, it was local, then it was more national. So it, it's the right side, right, for supply is is growing and becoming more national. But after 1920, most of the product of the market is just being eaten by New Yorkers. Right. Mm -hmm. You could get, um, you know, fish to Baltimore more easily through uh, the, the fish market in Baltimore or, or in Philadelphia than you could going through New York. But, you know, we we're talking about that Canadian example. That's got to be from, I mean, I can't remember exactly. I mean, I think it depends on the fish. But that's got to be from like the 1890s or the first decade of the 20th century, uh, where simply the everything is just shot through New York and then out again. Mm -hmm. um, many people have, have found the, the talk just fascinating. And uh, and yet another question about the, the reach of the Bronx market, um, you know, is there, well, how far do we go? Colorado or, far, or, or farther? Um, well, I mean, now um, I, 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 I've not been to the Bronx market, but I do know a little bit about their business model. Now you can go to FultonFishMarket.com and get it anywhere you are in the country. 
And that fish is going to be about the best fish you can get. Um, it's it's very interesting. Um, what you do is you don't freeze the fish. And so I'll say that your fish is never frozen. You keep it just above freezing. Uh, and you can preserve it in these, these semi-frozen packs and, and get it by mail, and it'll taste fantastic. Um, you know, in the you know, 1910s, first decade of the 20th century, um, it, it depends on the fish. Oysters are going furthest. Um, uh, but, you know, there are other other fish uh, like salmon, but there's a market all over. Um, one of the things I, I thought was very interesting, I didn't write about it, I didn't, I was sort of running out of space, um, is, is the lobster market. Um, lots of lots of consumption. Uh, New York ate all its own lobsters uh, pretty early on and then starts getting them from Maine. Uh, but then uh, that, that was a big thing running through Fulton. Mm -hmm. Would you like to hear a comment by Zeta Emmons who says um, <clears throat> that she lived above Messing Fish at 115 South Street from uh, 1981 to 2000. And she used to bake cookies on Friday and take them down to the fish market and was rewarded by being slipped a whole salmon <laughs> under the nose of the boss, um, along with a few sly remarks about uh, coming, uh, coming up to help with the baking. <laughs> That's terrific. I, it's great. I mean, it was it was a place. It was a. I mean, you can just tell. I mean, the person to talk to about the market, of course, is is Barbara. Uh, you know, who lived there in that same time and 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 knew just about everyone. Um, there's just I, again, I just want to emphasize this. My work is really skeletal. It's just it's a product of my sources and my location. Uh, and I think it, hopefully it's a it proves to be a good first try at the subject, but there's so much work that could be done, but that you know the sources themselves have to be generated and cultivated in the city itself. Well, we hope you will collaborate more with the South Street Seaport Museum so that there can, we can enrich the the history of place. Uh, in, in the, the venue where, where all of this uh, happened. And it, it does take, I, I think, um, a good historian and plenty of time in order to, to, to sift through the archives and the sources and to digest all of that food, um, yeah. food history, but also the history of transportation and technology. And as you say, the kind of evolving um, uh, adaptations of the market and technology to, to that market that uh, don't it changes the way that we eat, the ch it changes cities, um, and ultimately it, it changes the, the, the pattern of, of cities and, and place as well. So um, because it's seven o'clock and um, there are no other comments other than, than congratulations and thank you uh, in the in the queue here, we'll let you go um, to uh, uh, to a fish dinner or whatever. And um, thank everybody for joining us here tonight. Uh, look at our website for the upcoming talks, um, which will look at urban history and gentrification uh, in Harlem and in the South Bronx and on transportation systems. Uh, in the in the spring part of a kind of semester series looking at urban change um, in the same period of, in the 1980s um, that we've just been talking about this moment the uh, 1980s to the present when New York um, has has been through um, ups and downs and enormous change so um, thanks Jonathan for helping us document the the, the last um, decades um, as well as the the very beginnings of the Fulton fish market. I appreciate so, that. Thank, thank you. you all for coming. Okay. Thanks, everybody, and see you next time.